announced she was dating a woman. Hannah confided in her mom about how she felt this was wrong and cruel and didn't align with her personal faith. Hannah herself was dating a woman shortly after this. Babs around this time was dabbling in the Quaker life. While Hannah identified with a lot of it, she also made time to visit her father wherever the fuck he was at at the time. Despite his rigid beliefs, Hannah always conveyed a happy, healthy relationship with her dad. Many of her friends contemplated the idea that she had found a way to live essentially two separate lives while around him. However, Hannah never admitted that that was the case. As an adult, Hannah began to identify as a creationist. Up until now, I wasn't aware of what this entitled. I had actually never even heard of it. So for those of you like me, a quick Google search defines creationism as the belief that the universe and various forms of life were created by God out of nothing. So when Hannah met and became friends with, I'm so sorry, Payali Bhattacharya, and if I said that wrong, I am so sorry, but we're going to call you Payali. So when Hannah met Payali, who was actually Hindu, she was asked the question by Payali, do you think I'm going to hell? Rather than Hannah's response be a defensive stance or an explanation of her answer, Hannah actually crumbled into an emotional mess, which to me speaks volumes. It's a simple question, and it provoked an emotionally distraught reaction, which tells you there's a weight on her, a heavy weight, that she's struggling with. So while it may have been unclear to Hannah what her trigger was, it's pretty apparent that there was more than enough, in my opinion, to be a trigger. It sounds like her life up until this point was very religiously charged. It can be difficult, especially when you're trying to figure out what you believe in, and then add the divorce of your parents on top of that. It's it's rough. My parents divorced when I was at a young age, and to say it played a role in who I am now and how I've learned to perceive and process is an understatement. But we're going to go back to the investigation. So Hannah's hypnotized, and they come up empty as to what caused this. She does recall spending two days sleeping in her apartment, but she spoke to no one. Her bank records showed her going to see a movie that she had no memory of ever doing. Multiple family and friends believe that while she was completely checked out and lost to who she was, there were threads of recollection. She returned to her gym. She was able to log into Gmail possibly ate food that was being tossed out by grocers because they legally can't sell it. That apparently was like a thing that she did. The investigators met with the captain of the ferry to clarify where she was found, and based on the conditions and currents, they surmised that she went into the water around Lower Manhattan. They took Hannah there, she noted that Pier 40 felt familiar. Ironically, around September 11th, a Japanese Lantern Festival took place there in honor of those lost in the 9-11, the 9/11 attacks. It was something Hannah attended prior as a kid, and Babs assumed that that's what stuck to Hannah and brought her there. Now, the biggest issue many psychiatrists and psychologists alike were running into with Hannah's dissociation was that they'd never heard of someone navigating the world without some semblance of an identity. Like Ansel Bourne, he dropped one and created a brand new one. Hannah showed no signs of doing this. It was more of a roaming and a kind of dangerous nothing. This was pretty much where her investigation ended, though. Life continued on, and so did Hannah. She left New York and joined Babs in the Quaker life once again. She spent three years living and working at Pendle Hill, a sort of Quaker retreat, but accepting of all religions, after which Hannah accepted a job as a teaching assistant at a Montessori school for underserved children in Kensington, Maryland. She apparently went hard for this job and was uber passionate and fulfilled in helping children, which brings us to September of 2013. Babs gets a phone call from police. Hannah's gone again. 
Her wallet, purse, and cell phone are found on a woodsy path in Kensington. A co-worker reported seeing Hannah as they were heading to work that day, only she was heading in the wrong direction. This is all too familiar to Babs and Hannah's friends. They pack it up and head to Maryland and start scouring the area, posting missing persons flyers, the whole shipping. Maryland investigators uncover the fact that Hannah hadn't slept at home the night before and that no one had seen or spoke to her in over 24 hours. This was shaping up to look like the New York incident all over again. Her family braced for what was coming next. Oddly enough, the next night at about 10.30 p.m., Babs received a call. The person on the other line said, Mom? It was Hannah. She was using a stranger's cell phone to call Babs after essentially coming to in a muddy neighboring creek in Wheaton, a little under two miles from the school that she worked at. The only thing she had on her, or had with her, rather, was a shopping cart. By the time she came to she re and remembered who she was, she was sitting in this creek all alone. Later, Hannah realized that she had been roaming for more than two days. This fugue episode, while not as publicized and long as the original, was not any less confusing. Hannah was told by psychiatric professionals that after the initial incident, it was highly unlikely that she'd ever experience an episode again. When Hannah made it back home, family poured over all of Hannah's actions prior to the episode and found that they could actually see the moment she entered her fugue state through text messages. Hannah remembered certain texts she sent and certain ones that she didn't. There was a line that you could see. At this point, there wasn't anything she could do. She was diagnosed with a condition that may or may not exist, and no one has a cure to help as to how to fix it. Now, roughly a year after her second disappearance, Hannah moved again. I feel like that's probably what I would do to start over where people don't know your struggle type of deal. She accepted a new teacher's assistant job with a Montessori school on the U.S. Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. By all accounts, she thrived on the island. Her employer was made aware of her situation, but that didn't change anything. They loved her there. They felt that she added to their team, and they were happy to have her. And Hannah was happy to be there. She referred to this island as her palace. She made friends through both her job and through her social life, and really enjoyed going for ocean swims at her favorite beach, Sapphire Beach. Everything was going really well for Hannah. But on September 6, 2017, Hurricane Irma slammed into the island chain hard. It left many residents believing there was no coming back from this type of devastation. Luckily, Hannah and her friends hunkered down and were able to ride it out and come out the other side. Hannah texted friends and family that she was fine, but the damage was so bad that she didn't recognize the island anymore. Which, if I were them, I'd be like, oh shit. Her roommate from New York, Manuel, stayed in contact with Hannah, and they had kind of a code that they'd use when checking in with each other just to make sure Hannah was fine. Man Manuel would say, quote, a friendly vegetarian, with which Hannah would respond, who likes to try new dishes, as a way to verify she was still herself. It was an inside joke they had formed after reading a news article that described Hannah as such. Six days after Hurricane Irma, Hannah met up with her ex-boyfriend Joe Spolino at his house, only to find that he had vacated the island in preparation of Hurricane Maria, a new hurricane, readying up to slam into St. Thomas again just the following week. Both of these hurricanes were a Category 5, which I think is as big as it gets. If not, it's just pretty fucking big. So Hannah spoke to the landlord who told her, hey, yeah, Joe's leaving the island because he doesn't want to get fucked by Hurricane Maria. So Hannah's like, well, maybe I can catch him at the pier. So she heads down to the loading dock to catch him real quick to say bye. He asks her to come with him. And while she contemplates it briefly, she ultimately decides staying on the island is where she wants to be. Now, after this, Hannah never uses her phone again. The next day, she's headed to her job to help out in preparing for the hurricane. Her coworker there said she was essentially a robot, 
just responding with yes ma'am no ma'am and that really didn't fit her personality at all that night her roommates told her they'd be leaving the island hannah again reiterated that the island was her home and she wasn't leaving the next morning they saw her hop into her car saying she was heading to the school but she never arrived there the next day hannah missed a faculty meeting at her job her friend maggie called hannah's closest friends to try and get a hold of her but it was discovered it had been three days since anyone had spoken to her her family and friends both told maggie to look near the water for hannah obviously they were fearing that hannah was fuging out again her episodes usually happened around this time of year as it was Plus, with the devastation of the hurricanes, it was just not looking good for Hannah. So Maggie and friends decide to go on the hunt for Hannah. They start at her favorite beach, Sapphire Beach. There they find her car in the parking lot with her purse, wallet, passport, and cell phone inside. They head on to the beach. And keep in mind, it's still kind of roughed up from the hurricane that had just passed. We're talking like less than a week since... So they head to the beach, and near a beaten-up used-to-be bar, they find Hannah's sundress, sandals, and her car keys sitting on a stool. Now, the workers on the beach that were cleaning up the debris said they found them in the sand while they were cleaning it, and so they put them there. Being that Hannah was an avid ocean swimmer, they assumed she had gone swimming, so they took two boats and helicopters from the Coast Guard to search the water for her, fearing that maybe she got stranded on an island or she's just floating out there and needs help. They checked ship manifest to see if she was somehow on one of those and left the island, but again, they found nothing. It was as if Hannah had seemingly vanished once again. They searched for three days before being forced to call it off due due to the impending arrival of Hurricane Maria. The island once again hunkered down and rode out the Category 5 hurricane. After its passing, the search resumed, however, much more difficult given that any further potential evidence, or even Hannah for that matter, could have been swept out to sea. Tips and calls were coming in and being followed. Sightings of Hannah were coming in by the dozens, all followed, but to no avail. Babs came to the island in hopes of aiding in the search for Hannah. A lookalike mistaken as Hannah by the police consoled Babs, telling her, quote, I wish I was her for you. To this day, Hannah has remained missing. Her family believes she is still alive, stuck in her fugue state, not even realizing she's missing. Babs continues to email and text her, believing she will one day come back. Many others believe she was swept out to sea on that fateful morning swim at Sapphire Beach. However, the fact that she has never been recovered has baffled investigators. After a hurricane, bodies almost always drift back to shore. The New Yorker published an article regarding Hannah's case called How a Young Woman Lost Her Identity. That covers the story in fuller detail. I highly recommend reading it. Also, A&E's docuseries Vanished in Paradise, The Untold Story is an interesting watch as well. Now, there's been a lot of speculation over the years as to what actually happened to Hannah. I know a lot of people believe that she may still be in a fugue state, and given at the time of her disappearance, it was right around like the sandwich of two major hurricanes that were hitting the island, and people were essentially just scrambling to get off. So that leads a lot of people to believe that maybe she snuck onto a boat or maybe she even swam to another island and is now essentially living a whole new life yet not really knowing that she's Hannah. I don't know how I feel about this theory per se mainly because when we look back at her prior disappearances and also the psychologist noted this with Fugue you know people usually ditch the identity that they have and essentially form a brand new one however hannah never did this when she went through her fugue states it seems like she 
didn't identify as anyone and 